Hello, welcome to today's webcast, Getting Started with Digital ID, a look inside California's mobile driver's license program. I'm Russ Nichols, I'm a senior fellow with the Center for Digital Government, and I'm excited to serve as host for today's session. Thank you for joining us. I think this is gonna be a great session that's near and dear to my heart uh, because I grew up in California state government. So really looking forward to this. Before we dive into the content, I have a few uh, brief housekeeping notes. First, we want this section, session to be interactive. You can participate by submitting questions using the Q&A widget that's at the bottom of your screen. And please go ahead and send those in throughout the, the presentation. We'll try to address some of those in the flow of the conversation. We're also going to have a Q&A section uh, at the end of the session. So uh, anything we didn't cover in the natural flow, we'll specifically try to address those questions. And if we're running long and, and we can't get to the questions, those will be provided to the speakers and the organization so they can respond after the session is done. So uh, please go ahead and submit your question uh, as we go through this. Down there you'll in that tray, you'll also see the ability to increase or decrease the size of the player and the windows. At the end of the session, we'll also be emailing a link to the recording of the session to all our registered uh, participants. Please feel free to take a look at that yourself and to share it with anybody that you think might get value out of seeing the session. There will also be a brief survey, so please fill that out. We're always looking for improvement suggestions, so go ahead and take that survey at the end. We also recommend you disable any pop-up blockers, and if you see any technical problems, you can't hear us, you can't see slides, things along those lines, there's a help button, um, and there's also a webcast help guide that are available in the tool. So go ahead and ask any of those questions uh, if you need assistance. All right, so that does it for the housekeeping. Um, today, I have a couple of distinguished guests with me. First, Ajay Gupta. He's the Chief Digital Transformation Officer for the DMV in California. I also have Wayne Chang. He's the uh, Ch Chang, I'm sorry, uh, founder and CEO of Spruce ID. So thank you gentlemen for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Russ Nichols, a senior fellow for Center for Digital Government. And uh, I grew up in California state government. I spent 32 years there and retired as the deputy CIO for the state of California. This topic for me is, is very interesting. We've talked about how to improve government services and this is a piece of that. So I'm really looking forward to getting into this. Um, let me have you two introduce yourselves just a little bit. Ajay, if you want to give a little bit of your background uh, for the audience. Thank you. Uh, sure. Thanks, Russ. A uh, quick sound check. You can hear me? Yes? Yes. Great. Um, well, um, well, thank you for having me today. Uh, very excited to share what we're doing in the state of California. My name is Ajay Gupta, Chief Digital Transformation Officer for State of California DMV. Uh, I was appointed by the governor's office uh, in 2020 ish, around that time frame, to help with uh, business and technology transformation for Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, and since then, um, well, COVID hit us and um, uh, we took quite a bit of opportunity. For those of you who are Californians in the audience, hopefully you saw what we have done uh, with the DMV in terms of transforming our services, uh, both. Uh, the brick and click and call, um, they have been transformed uh, to a point that acceptable um, uh, to our citizens, to our residents of California. Uh, so proud to say we have had some good recognitions as well uh, in that regard and some very good metrics to share um, at some point in time if those conversations come up. But uh, happy to be here. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ajay. And Wayne, if you'd take a couple of seconds to introduce yourselves, yourself as well. Great. Uh, my name is Wayne Chang, founder and CEO of Spruce ID. Our mission is to let users control their data across the web. Instead of people signing into platforms, we think platforms should sign into people's data vaults that they control entirely. And that's also the architecture that we're using in California. And basically, there are a lot of important technical shifts over the years allowing us to get to this point. Uh, I'm trained as an engineer, and I've been working on user managed identity for over seven years now. All right. Thank you, Wayne. As we jump into this, uh, let's talk about the, the business need and what we're really trying to accomplish here and, and maybe set some context. So, um, you know, we've all moved into this digital world. I use, you know, my cell phone or my, my smartphone for all kinds of things, not just email or text anymore. Um, you know, I use it for DMV services, for example, to, to register my vehicles. I did that this week uh, from my smartphone. It's a very simple uh, process. 
but all kinds of things we can do, checking in at airlines and, and a lot of functionality. But mobile identification has been a topic that's been bounced around a lot. Um, I think it has different meanings to folks, and we'll go through some of that today. Um, and there are other attributes to it, like fraud protection and uh, reducing the cost of operations, whether it's for the holder of the credential to renew or the cost of businesses in, in identity proofing and verification. Um, there's a lot of convenience there. And, and government agencies consume them as well. So a lot of potential here and a lot of reason to do this. And in fact, uh, Gartner Group uh, considered this application in particular um, it, among a number of uh, submitted applications and awarded the DMV with an Ion Innovation Award for government. And so uh, we're gonna take a quick look at a video about the uh, application. Um, Anna Jay and Wayne, congratulations on that recent award. So let's go ahead and look at that video real quickly. With increasing demand for digital and online services, there's an equally important need to reduce the cost of identity and age verification processing and related fraud opportunities by the government and commercial service providers. There's a need to create a product and a service that's easy to use by the residents of California and economical to consume for the public and private industry service providers online and in person. The current repeated identity proofing costs and privacy concerns around information sharing requires improving the status quo. A mobile credential on a mobile wallet addresses this need with a voluntary secure digital version of a California driver's license or identification card. While there are many mobile wallets and digital credentials in the marketplace, this product, intended to be open source to share all the benefits and effort with the rest of the world, provides unique value proposition to all the citizens of the world. Its design is based on the use of many privacy-preserving features of mobile phones, like secure elements and biometrics matching, and global industry standards from ISO, W3C, and NIST to provide an equitable and privacy-preserving digital credential. This includes using machine learning and AI to capture and match photo and detecting for fraud while preserving race and gender diversity, seeking consent using strong cryptography and temper evident digital signatures for data transmission and consent based on selective disclosure of consumer data. We are creating an ecosystem with this product to benefit day-to-day -day use cases to simplify travel, shopping, and online transactions. But more importantly, enable us to serve our homeless population, disaster relief services, and improve safety for law enforcement scenarios. More than 200,000 DMV wallet mobile driver's licenses have been adopted by Californians in the first four weeks it's been available, making California the largest issuer of MDLs in the United States. This secure platform is already certified by U.S. Department of Homeland Security Transportation Security Administration for air travel use and by the True Age Program for nationwide use in convenience stores. All right. So um, as we get started in the conversation, we'll, we'll decompose a lot of that over the next hour. But let me uh, throw up a quick poll question for the audience. So take uh, 30 seconds and just give us a quick response to this. How familiar are you with mobile driver's licenses or other digital identity credentials? You can select any of them that apply and we'll see a histogram here shortly of the responses. Um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, lots of talk about this in general, whether you go to a conference or just online, you see things on the news, um, but not necessarily a lot of understanding of the details. So, Let's jump in and talk a little bit about the complexities. And, and again, we'll come back and see the results here momentarily. So, so please select the options that are most appropriate to you. So as we jump into that, Wayne and Ajay, let's talk a little bit about what this is. You know, uh, I think from a lay uh, person's um, point of view, um, a lot of us pictured a digital uh, driver's license as a photocopy or a, or a digital picture on my phone that I can show people. And it's a lot more complex than that. And, and so as we pop up the poll results, you can see that uh, folks are interested in it, they're actively exploring, but it's kind of a, a, an equal split across all of the responses that we got there, the biggest one being the, the interest. 
So, so um, Ajay, maybe we start with you and then we'll pop to Wayne second. Um, what are some of the complexities? What is a, a digital, digital driver's license and why is it important? Yeah, so the, the, the why part, I think, uh, would be well served by talking about the need first, right? So as you can imagine, uh, in today's world, um, our lives are quite a bit digital, more so with COVID when we had to create, you know, physical separation, more services, more things people got used to doing online and digital. So there is that need and expectation that's created. And with the younger generation who like to be rather be twiddling their thumb on a phone rather than being out and about in the world talking to people right with eye contact they expect digital services they expect the services to be provided and available on their mobile phone so as more and more services are being made available with that the need to verify you are who you are comes in and that with that comes in you know possible fraud scenarios with digital comes in digital access to your systems and your accounts and things, uh, how do you verify? Uh, how do you reduce fraud, societally speaking? And also from commercial uh, and both commercial and governmental purposes, the cost of verifying the identity or the cost of not verifying the identity in terms of fraud um, and the, you know, the lost uh, you know, dollars and cents and time, et cetera, in terms of analyzing those fraud cases is pretty high. Um, in addition to that, there is the users are looking for reduced friction. Uh, even the people who know very little, right, digital literacy wise, they still want to be able to do things um, on uh, digital channels, simplified for them. Their daily life, their digital life is all merging and converging. And with that comes in this particular need. Now, with that comes in the complexity, right? For us to be able to issue something that can be trusted, just like a driver's license, which by the way, can be faked as well. We have very special security elements that we work with our card providers, but fraudsters are constantly catching up, right? So the physical card uh, fake IDs are still in circulation. I guess it's a uh, it's a rite of passage in this country at times uh, to be to have a fake ID. But the general idea is to reduce that and really eliminate it with introducing the cryptography that's involved with something like a digital credential. So the complexities are, how do you, first of all, make sure that if you're giving somebody a digital ID, identity, how do you make sure they are who they are? How do you make sure you get their trust, whether once they start using it, are we creating a digital trail? How do you create transparency that we are not collecting, right? There is no phone home or big brother watching some of those perceptions. How do you get around some of those items as well? Um, in terms for now, if even if we issued a digital ID, how can the market consume it without really revamping? So if you were to think of Apple and Google uh, wallets, it took close to 10 years for people to really start using it. Now it's in play. We would like to be, uh, we'd like to short circuit that time as well. So that complexity was always there. In addition to that, <clears throat> as Californians, we also have diversity both diversity in geography, race, gender, digital literacy as well. So how do we make sure the technologies that we use are going to be equitable? They are not going to disadvantage a particular population, whether in terms of getting the credential or using the credential. So a lot of states are very focused on uh, air travel because TSA has opened up mobile driver licenses, but that's a privileged use of a product that should be available to everybody and should be usable by everybody. So therefore, Calif as Californians, uh, we would, I would be talking about how we created a more equitable marketplace as well and constantly working towards it. So those are some of the complexities um, around the use and the marketplace, but then there is privacy complexities as well. Are we sharing more? Are we sharing less than when I would just give hand the driver license over to you and you'll have really all the information that I had? Uh, so those are some of the things that we navigated around putting this right. product together. Right. Thank you, Ajay. And and Wayne, as you work with California and and really at a, a national level on, on efforts like this, what are some of the complexities that have come up that you've had to work through? Yeah. I would also like to underscore um, Ajay's mention of the why, 
right? Because a lot of it starts there. And to the point about fraud, I think in a recent FinCEN report, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, it pegged that figure at, I think, $212 billion of, of identity verification breakdown fraud, right? So if we had better solutions for this, understanding what the goal is, um, how to build solutions that can help us prevent that kind of fraud adds a lot of complexities. Um, because today it's it, like, the physical IDs that we have with the really advanced protections built in, as Jay was talking about, that works when you're in person inspecting the thing. But if you're trying to hold a driver's license up in front of a webcam and you know activate security features, it's it's not necessarily made for that, right? So figuring out how do we create digital identities that work in the digital era and also retain the properties that we like about physical identity cards. Like every time you use it, there's not someone tracking where you used it, right? You just kind of use it and get on with it and doesn't create surveillance then, why should it create surveillance now, right? So um, thinking through how do we keep the parts that we like, but even improve the other parts for the use cases. Um, so for example, one of the important features of the mobile driver's license and other related digital credentials is the ability to selectively disclose information, right? So when you're showing your physical driver's license to someone and you're just revealing all your data fields, especially if they take a photocopy of it. You might've seen that happen at a hotel or, or something and think about, wait a minute, where's that going? Where's it gonna get filed away to? With the mobile driver's license, <clears throat> with selective disclosure built in to the ISO and other standards like from W3C, you're able to just share the data fields you actually wanna share and nothing more. And, you're, and because it's all digital, you, it, instead of having you know just the 20 data elements, you can have lots of them, including things that are you just over 21 or not, yes or no, without revealing a date of birth, right? So one can enter a bar without disclosing their home address, without disclosing uh, basically um, what their exact date of birth is or any of the other PII and just pass the check and get to where they need to go. And all that information is not retained. But to think about these use cases now and reimagine them so that, okay, what's the minimal set of information we need? What's the user experience like? So it's even better than uh, trying to hold a clumsy physical ID up in front of a webcam. That introduces a lot of pro uh, product complexities because you need to address those from the wallet itself. Uh, you need to address those from the base technologies that can enable the disclosure modes you want. And it has to all be thought through for the particular use case every use case. So I think there's a lot of work, but also a lot of potential benefit to be had across the implementation. And then I'll also add that um, understanding what exists now, because those things are not going away. There are mission critical systems that tend to hold a lot of these data and to add the additional components that are necessary to get to where we need to go from the privacy and security side, you know, we have to start thinking about managing cryptographic keys and what's security behind that. And that's something that you know organizations will need to start getting smart on if they want to uh, do well in the world of digital credentials. So those are a lot of the considerations that add complexities. All right, thank you, Wayne. Um, so we'll continue this uh, discussion a little more. Uh, we'll also get into some of the technical aspects, but let's pop up another poll question uh, for the moment. What do you think about using a mobile identity credential in your daily life? Again, um, uh, oops. Got the wrong uh, poll question. Uh, so let's see if we can get back to the other one. Uh, what do you think about using a uh, mobile identity credential in your daily life? Um, I'd love to. I don't want to carry my physical wallet. So again, um, pick the one that uh, or the ones that apply to you. We'll take a look at the results here in a minute. Um, so in that discussion, we talked a little bit about a couple of things that. I think at, at first blush, people don't think about it. You know, if I just had a picture of my uh, driver's license, that is easy to take into Photoshop and, and modify things along those lines. So it's not very verifiable for a business or a consumer. The ability to protect information when I go to the pharmacy to buy Sudafed because I've got a head cold, they don't need to know the endorsements that I have on my driver's license. They don't need to know that I can pull a trailer. Um, or, or, you know, a simple example, but you could think about that in any uh, entity or any business uh, where they ask for your ID. Uh, sometimes they just need the picture and your name to verify that you are who you purport that you are and may not even need age. So to, to make those responses appropriate for the situation, there's a lot of technical capabilities in there in the ability to read and process and, and verify 
and then the question of how do you actually verify. Um, and I think we'll get to that a little bit in more detail as we go through the conversation. But it's not as simple as seeing that there is a credential. How do I know that it's valid? Um, how do I know that there hasn't been some intervening action or offense that invalidated that driver's license? So a, a peace officer would want to know that if they pulled you over. Um, things along those lines. So we'll get into that a little more. Uh, in the meantime, let's take a look at the responses and see where people are. So uh, I'd love to not carry my physical card is is taking the bulk of the answers and it'd be useful to share my entity. Uh, uh, my identity or age verification online is, uh, is second. So Wayne and Ajay, any, any surprise in the responses there? Those top two, um, you know, far outweighing the others. Um, you know, trailing, I'm concerned about uh, identity being available digitally. Um, any surprises in those responses? Um, you know, it's interesting. Convenience obviously looks like is on the top. Uh, convenience versus utility, which is the second item, right? Um, the uh, I think in my mind, they're kind of uh, at the same level, but here, uh, looks like convenience is uh, important. I'm assuming the audience, depending on the you know the generation that we are talking, the answer would change. But I do want to talk about the very bottom part, which is the concern about the identity. Something I didn't talk about the complexity of it, right? When you move your identity to a particular phone, how do you make sure that it's actually secure and truly decentralized? So today's phones are equipped with this particular thing called a secure element, right? Things where you have your secure files, things that are not going to be cloned when you move to the you know another phone etc that's what we are really utilizing to make sure that this identity is truly decentralized and truly available on just that device not even a clone of that device when you upgrade your phones right you migrate all your apps your identity is not going to migrate so therefore if your device was stolen even you're not going to lose that particular identity because it's bound to your biometrics uh, meaning your fingerprint, your face ID, uh, or a pin code, uh, uh, or a pattern, right? So if somebody else got hold of it, they still cannot decrypt that particular secure element with existing cryptographical techniques. So that's an extremely important part for the audience to understand. It's a good concern, and it's there. The second part of it is because we are open sourcing it, we are, our claim is true, and you're welcome to verify that there is no phone on home involved when you use your identity so that the worry about the digital trail is actually addressed. And uh, Wayne is welcome to talk about how um, we are actually making an additional efforts that even the consumers, the relying parties, the verifiers, how they, when they use such information, they still cannot correlate back to the same consumer either from transaction yeah. to transaction. So th those are the some of the things that I think are becoming clear. It's a good thing that a lot of people are concerned because we are here, given our open source and given the multiple standard support, that we are actually directly uh, addressing that particular uh, problem head on. We put significant effort into figuring out all the different points where privacy could be compromised or someone could unwittingly introduce surveillance. So I think it's all about getting every single check done engaging with uh, independent experts that are brought in. And it's not an easy thing to do when you have a lot of stuff to build, but you know, uh, just in terms of priorities, uh, it's important to engage with those folks. And I think that understanding that we have those uh, protections built in and it operates like a little data vault that the user has, that's their thing, they can bring it around and there's no one looking into it without their consent is really important. There are also a lot of areas for innovation here too, to basically allow for better user utility while also protecting against things like oversharing of data. So having ideas around, you know, um, is someone fraudulently collecting a bunch of information, right? When we can send a mobile driver's license over the internet, right? Doesn't that allow a lot of phishing sites to ask for pretty sensitive information from the user, right? So if you're getting asked for everything, shouldn't that look differently than if it's appropriate amount of disclosure, right? So thinking about what are the policy aspects of that? What are the technical safeguards we can have in place so it really flags the user without restricting their ultimate control over their mobile driver's license? But hey, did you know that these things are being asked by this entity? being very clear about that in the UX, right? That's how we get towards good consent models. 
And I think that also the California DMV is especially a good place to start with it because in California, there was something called the Driver's Privacy Protection Act passed in, uh, I think, the 90s after an actress was uh, very sadly murdered uh, <clears throat> because of some uh, digitization or lookup of records that was inappropriate. It led to reforms that led to the first anti-stalking laws. Uh, and basically, it's a very strong privacy base to start from because the agency is definitely on the, the side of the end user. So it's technology and it's also policy things to protect too. Absolutely. And, and obviously, this is an area that will continue to grow and develop. Um, you know, the digital driver's license is, is one uh, credential that will be in a digital wallet. Uh, there will be other services in there as well, and, and that will continue to grow over time. And, and so, uh, you know, it's not the one size fits all or the be all end all, uh, but part of a puzzle that comes together and, and folks and agencies and, and software companies are going to work together to make sure that, that uh, privacy is maintained and things along those lines. So um, we're kind of headed that way anyway. So let's jump in a little bit to the technical uh, side of this, the technical strategy. And, and Ajay, maybe a simple question for you. Um, why would we build an app rather than um, you know, buy something that's out there in the commercial space already? Yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's a good question. And it was a big question for us ourselves. But to answer that question, I want to take back to the complexities question that we talked about as well, right? I specifically talked about the creating the opportunities in the marketplace for both the consumer and the, well, the, the holder and the consumer of this particular type of product. The very important thing was that we make sure that the people who are gonna be consuming can trust the product. It's a brand new thing. Can I trust it? You know, the concerned people, the 29%, that we saw, we wanted to address that particular piece head on. The commercial, uh, commercially available options that are still, by the way, coming up, even the standards are evolving. So I wouldn't say that there is off the shelf, shelf thing that are already available. It's very, um, very tactical market at this point in time where uh, states and issuers are working with specific uh, technology providers to build these products out, but we, we're very focused on the privacy, which is the strictest in the nation, as uh, Wayne has mentioned. Um, uh, you know, very compar comparable to GDPR in EU. And um, in general, we are also worried about the perception part of it. So therefore, we uh, wanted to create some options in the marketplace. We wanted to create what we call as a native wallet uh, landscape. We wanted to create a third party landscape where other third parties can also participate as a holder, as a wallet provider for mobile driver license, but also create an open source ecosystem where uh, we can address concerns from uh, privacy advocates like ACLU, who are very worried about the type of um, standards we are using and how it uh, is a disadvantage to certain type of uh, you know market segments and even consumers and holders. So. Open sourcing was one of the uh, one of the ways we can create transparency that there is no digital trail, there is no uh, phone home, your information is protected. But secondly, we also wanted to create a multiple standard ecosystem. So most of the commercial uh, products that are you know you will hear about in the marketplace, they are only looking at uh, a particular standard. We actually looked at around the globe what the what's happening. I looked at other state agencies, other federal entities, uh, entities in the EU, what they are up to as well on how they can facilitate creating a market quickly. So it creates an advantage for our customers. Um, and therefore, ours is the only wallet in the nation, and this is in line with the governor's announcement that we are going to be different. We are going to be different, and we are on the side of the holder, privacy protecting, open source, so you can see, and transparent, but also supporting multiple standards, so we can open up a larger landscape of uh, uh, verifiers and consumers who can actually use this particular product. So, and then on top of that, as you know, we talked about the complexities around the digital literacy um, and equity and the, you know, we need to use AI and machine learning. How do we reduce the bias 
the only way we can do it is by nitpicking and choosing the right algorithms that would reduce the uh, bias uh, as it's associated with matching your face to a photo, as it's matching the data, as it's looking at the risk associated with a particular device. So some of those things we were able to pick and choose. So we are not just banking on the bias that perhaps the commercial providers may have and they're very proprietary about it. So we were able to create a transparent ecosystem from that standpoint. So now to answer the question in terms of the technology part of it, we created an open source multi-standard. We created uh, uh, algorithms or use algorithms that are equitable and bias reducing. We have worked with global work groups um, uh, to figure out what this market is going to look like and what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. So it gave us that freedom, but still for Californians options to choose from. They don't need to use an open source if they don't want to. They can use a commercial wallet if they look for a particular convenience, et cetera. But on top of that, our technical strategy is a little bit more than that. We intend to add more products and services on top of this particular wallet, which we can do for public service, for example, disaster recovery um, and additional DMV products for convenience, things that we can try with law enforcement in terms of convenience and safety. We don't need to bank on the digital giants to come up with their roadmap and us sticking to it. We can really try things out as we see fit uh, for our needs. So that flexibility for California DMV was obviously uh, opened up with this particular platform. I appreciated partnering with uh, a startup like Spruce ID who are extremely nimble um, in coming up with ideas, open sourcing the work that we are creating um, and also working with industry standards rather than proprietary. So that's been, uh, that's been uh, very useful for us as well. All right, thank you, Ajay. And, and Wayne, I'm gonna come back to you in a second, but, but before we uh, go there, let's pull up the next poll question and ask folks, what do you think about open sourcing the DMV wallet to improve transparency in government services? Um, so again, uh, select the response that's most appropriate to you. We'll take a look at that data here in a second. And, and Wayne, um, as we work on those standards, we talked about things evolving and changing. I know that you're doing some some work on the proposed standards. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, of course. And it's all use case driven, as Ajay is mentioning. Um, what do we want to do? Do we want to allow people to have temporary, you know, identities if there's a disaster scenario and the network's out? Right? Is it possible to do that? Um, are we going to have safer ways for people to share their identities to law enforcement so there's less risk for everyone? You know, can we send things over the internet so you can open a bank account with this instead of holding that plastic card in front of the webcam? Um, there are a lot of possibilities here, and it's very important that these are leading the way. What do people actually want to be able to do with this, and what are the kinds of safeguards and protections they want while they do that? And um, that really is our standards participation strategy. So at Spruce, we have multiple people in the different working groups across ISO, W3C, the ITF, OpenID, and we care a lot about it being a two-way process. Instead of just you know accepting whatever gets developed in the working group, having an opinion uh, and a suggested best practice based on the use cases we're trying to excel at, right? That's important because we're able to add that feedback to the working group and address any shortcomings or opportunities for additional collaboration in front of the panel of experts, uh, global technology leaders in this and getting their feedback and coordinating better. And we think that's the most productive way to work with it. Most recently, we hosted the interoperability event for 18013 part seven. That's how do you present the mobile driver's license over the internet um, as Spruce ID. And uh, we did it in conjunction with ISO, with AMVA and Osroads. And we saw some very promising results that we published um, with participation from uh, well-known brand names like Panasonic, Google, Okta, and et cetera, who are all very interested about how are these digital identity ecosystems going to develop? And I think that it is really important that a market ecosystem develops around this because it's great for agencies to have tons of choice in terms of what vendors they want to work with and how it tailors to their particular use cases. Um, but also it is a flywheel, right? Like it's a chicken and egg problem. We have to have, uh, like Ajay was saying about the different credit cards getting into the different uh, native wallets on the phones. 
Um, it's a matter of people have to have enough wallets for merchants to want to accept it. And then enough merchants want to have to be able to accept it for people to want to provision it to their wallets, right? So I think that the internet is probably one of the strongest use cases in terms of being able to fight identity fraud and um, basically produce a lot of new economic opportunities too. It's always so easy to see what is lost, like money being lost to fraud from uh, the unemployment benefits programs to other sorts of public sector benefits. And even in the private sector, there's a mountain of fraud, um, but also what can be gained, right? Having a million users save like 30 seconds across their onboarding processes or just having an easier time might be the difference between using a service in their daily life and not, right? So this could allow for brand new businesses to exist too and drive economic development if we can solve this important problem. So many businesses today exist because we have a driver's license for people and they can use that to, you know, let the business feel comfortable enough to do business with them and allow these transactions to happen. And, you know, it's time to upgrade this for the digital era, making sure that we build in the strong privacy and security protections as well. And, and Russ, uh, there's one thing that I forgot to mention on why you know, having our own particular product uh, as well, uh, while we are working with, you know, native wallet providers too, uh, was the simple fact that we also want uh, the digital giants to understand uh, certain niche use cases, right? For example, if there is uh, use cases like disaster recovery or use cases that are specific to public sector that may not have a monetization or commercial value to them, but if they see certain adoption and we are able to show the way, the market is going to be able to take on some of those niche use cases too. We are the United States Postal Service of the world, right? We serve every customer. We may not be a particular, like, I don't know, uh, FedEx is a bad example because they do go many, many places that uh, others don't. But, you know, other courier services that may not go to a particular location at all. We have to serve everybody. And therefore, we are forcing the agenda for the digital giants too by showcasing certain use cases that they are not going to contemplate unless they see some market and some inertia to Wayne's point. Yeah. And I, yeah, that's a great point because, um, you know, these product managers working at large tech companies are extremely busy and they've got their own prerogatives. They have revenue targets. They have quarterly results that they're on the hook for. Right. So if we really want to be able to innovate in the public sector and focus on use cases that are going to provide massive amounts of utility, but maybe not sales of a certain product or other aspects, then it's important to have that flexibility and be able to go at it. So instead of trying to just petition a really busy product manager who's making a decision for maybe, you know, like uh, billions of users, um, understanding that we can create a really great solution for the people that we're serving is important flexibility to maintain, comes with its own costs and overheads. But I think that the ROI in many cases is worth it. All right, thank you, Wayne. And, and going back to our poll, uh, we popped up the results there. Uh, what do folks think about sharing it? Um, everything from I'm concerned about uh, anything that's basically open source at, at about 20% uh, to the other uh, most popular answer, I find it useful to know the data is being shared and, and uh, open source, source technology is being used. So um, interesting information there. So let's talk a little bit about the roadmap of where we go. So both of you mentioned the business case or the use cases that go with this. So Ajay, uh, you know, this was launched in August of this year, so it's still brand new. And right now the you know focus on is on getting this adopted, uh, both from the people that carry the credentials and you mentioned the business community or the, the uh, folks that consume them. But what's on the roadmap, um, you know, coming up say in the next, um, year or 18 months. Yeah, so th this is what I'm most excited about, right? Putting a product out there that's really cool and interesting was great, but important thing is to how do we create that market? Uh, how do we create the need? And how do we create the excitement on both sides, right? For people to then, then have that inertia and then it kind of automatically goes from there. So what we are looking for, so if you were to divide the use of a digital credential into uh, uh, air travel specifically because that's how it all started, right? With TSA, digital life 
and daily life. So we are focused on both. For specific to daily life, we do, once again, going back to the governor's claim on that we're going to be very different. We already are different. We have uh, partnered with National Association of Convenience Stores. It's a nonprofit that has 156,000 uh, partnerships with local, you know, local corner shops and convenience stores uh, for age verification. Um, and we have partnered with them looking, uh, working with a particular type of standard called verifiable credential to be able to use that and retrofit that into the existing POS devices so you can validate the age of somebody digitally uh, and so they don't have to, you know, take their driver license out. They can just open the wallet and unlock and, you know, present the QR code and scan, and their age is verified. But in what we call as a pseudonymous fashion. So that's already in. So we have the air travel and this convenience store thing in, and we are expanding convenience stores across uh, California, but also across the U.S. So a Californian going to another uh, location will still be able to use this these type of products and services. Uh, beyond that, we are working with uh, the banking sector. Uh, Wayne talked about FinCEN, Financial uh, Crime Enforcement uh, Network. The, we are actually working with them too to understand what are the concerns people have around digital credentials and what are the things they are looking for from digital credentials too at a national level, at a federal level. But also working with credit unions uh, and banks and payment processors to start accepting this as an identity verification mechanism. So that's um, the goal is to have some of that actually out there in the next year. In fact, in the next six months. Um, we are also looking to add more products, identity specific products that DMV has at a minimum, like a registration card, a title and occupational licensing, a disabled placard ID, all on the DMV wallet. We are gonna enable services in public sector, in DMV and other state entities, um, Wayne talked about entities like EDD, Health and Human Services, et cetera, that look for identity verification. There is cost associated with it. You upload a copy of the driver license, right? Somebody would verify it. True or not, there is the cost of the fraud. Then there is the cost of operations of kind of humanly verifying it or paying third party vendors to verify it. With a decentralized identity, the cost is really maintaining the IT cost of consuming a mobile driver license, and that is it. You're not paying by the drink for every single identity verification that you're doing operationally, et cetera. We're also looking to add um, uh, additional uh, features like, uh, well, first of all, we are also working with law enforcement. That's something, an important piece that, okay, in the holy grail to us for an acceptance of a driver license and ID is when law enforcement starts accepting it. So we are actually collaborating with uh, California Highway Patrol and few local uh, uh, police departments and sheriff's departments to understand how we can make this work. In, uh, in order to make that work, we are actually introducing a reader on our DMV wallet, meaning it will be able to read the another person's, a peer-to-peer, -peer, so a, a, a safety officer to uh, a driver uh, one peer to another peer, right? In a disaster recovery use case, just verifying identities. Scan or tap, and you'll be able to get their information and be able to verify that they are age appropriate. You know, if you want to enter bars or if you want to verify their identity and the address, you can do some of that using our own wallet with the reader inbuilt. So not only it's sh uh, enabled to show your identity, it'll be able to verify somebody else's identity that, yep, it's true and it's real, not a fake, not a screenshot of things, right? right? So those are some of the things that we are working on and very excited about. I'm also looking at making our online services easier and hopefully that becomes more of a trend because NIST actually, uh, NIST ha uh, has a, a particular initiative out in the same regard as well, where we can use mobile driver license to create a frictionless login or frictionless identity verification so you can log into your online services using just your mobile driver license. So those are some of the exciting things that we are working on uh, in the next one. year. All right. Thank yeah. you, Jane. And uh, for the folks in the audience, uh, two things. One, we popped up a po another poll question. Where are li you likely to use the MDL in the future? Again, please select any of those that apply to you. And we'll take a look at the results here in a uh, few minutes. Um, 
Uh, Wayne, anything else in the roadmap that you're focused on, uh, maybe even beyond uh, California? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> as as a vendor in the space, right, we talk to a lot of different agencies, um, even other states about use cases. And I think there is a lot of excitement about this cohesion that's possible. Because if we do have something that is signed off by the DMV on, uh, well, there's a lot of ambition to accept this in all places, especially for secure access to government e-services. Um, there was the COVID fraud epidemic with um, the, I think, uh, just billions and billions of unemployment benefits fraud and people trying to do something about it and modernize systems. And um, there's also ways to use the driver's license there when it's already issued, it's less expensive than trying to pay for an, a third party identity verification service. And it might be even stronger because it's a real signature issued by the state. Whereas when people show up with their physical licenses for some of the services, it's like a photo of a photo of a photo and there, you have a quality deterioration on it. But basically to have this from the horse's mouth credential literally issued by the DMV to use that to be able to receive unemployment benefits or access healthcare, et cetera. You know, this is starting to play into a broader identity ecosystem uh, strategy, which recently I, I'll point out that California has uh, released one that incorporates the California DMV wallet as a pillar in it. And I think that it's really exciting to make sure that this works across different agencies in California and beyond even for interstate commerce, uh, even for federal agencies. I think that at a certain point, it's within a national security interest to have a strong industry for digital identity uh, because there are a lot of different vendors to pick from and expertise built in. Um, the reason why um, the same way that we have strong footing in networks from Cisco, Junipers, and Palo Alto networks in the world, right? So I think that um, there's a lot of interest in as these things get digital, can they interoperate across the different states? Can they interoperate across the same online services and create an ecosystem that has privacy and security at the core as well? All right, thanks Wayne. Uh, as you can see, we popped up the uh, results of the survey there. And, uh, you know, frankly, all of those options are uh, come back with a very positive, positive response. Where would you like to use a mobile driver's license in the future? Um, so, Ajay, any, any thoughts on the uh, numbers that you're seeing there? Well, I'm excited about public, sec public services being, you know, on the, in the top two, right? Actually, maybe top three. So, uh, and that's my agenda, right, as a public servant. Uh, my, I'm excited about partnering with other state entities and making the lives of our residents who use the services uh, easier and also reduce the cost for the state as well, which is an important aspect too. The operational burden of verifying identity or having a fraud situation uh, is pretty high and uh, looking forward to uh, you know handling that and, and providing some solutions for the rest of the state of California departments. All right, thank you, Ajay. All right, we're gonna transition shortly into the Q&A section. So again, a reminder for the folks in the audience, uh, if you have some questions, go ahead and pop those in. We've tried to address a number of them as they came up in the conversation. I also wanna go back and pop up that first poll question again. How familiar are you with mobile driver's license or other digital identity credentials? Um, we realized we pulled that down uh, a little bit quickly and so, uh, not everyone that wanted to uh, submit a response was able to do that. So go ahead and uh, 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 respond to that question and we'll capture that data as well. So uh, as we get ready to transition into the um, Q&A section, I just wanna uh, kind of summarize a couple of things here, uh, maybe from the perspective of the folks that are consuming these. So what are what's in it for um, the government agencies, the relying parties, the holders. So when we talk about relying parties, for example, those are the businesses or the government uh, public service organizations that need to be able to uh, depend upon uh, that identification. And, and in the future, you know, I, one of the things I think I heard you guys allude to is cost reduction, the simplification of that process of uh, being able to consume those identifications. Um, and, it, and that simple process translates essentially to an easier time for the employees of those organizations that have to process the idea. Uh, for the holders, uh, one of the things that you guys mentioned is, is uh, the convenience of not necessarily having to have a physical document with you. 
but one of the, the other things that I think you guys said that it's really important is it's it's actually more secure than a physical document. Um, and as this evolves over time, it will continue to improve. Uh, you know, the age old stories about college students replicating a, a driver's license have been around forever. And, and with this digital platform, um, I think that as this matures, it'll be much more secure than the, the physical document that we carry. And for the government agencies that issue them, you know, that, that process now becomes uh, consistent and verifiable and will mature over time and will reduce the burden uh, on those folks as well. So uh, I think a lot of perks in this as we go forward. So, so let's transition now to some of the Q&A um, uh, that was actually submitted. Um, we're gonna pop up the results. Um, this is again, that first question that we asked, but it's now got uh, more results behind it. So you could, you uh, were able to see that real quickly. But let's talk about this. One of the simple questions that came in um, that I don't think we mentioned, will this be available for folks that hold a commercial driver's license? Um, um, uh, Jay, yeah, so the, the answer is yes, it's actually available today. So if you're a commercial driver license holder, you can get a mobile driver license today as well. Uh, for specifically for commercial uh, driver license, there is other things that we, you know, just I'm taking this forum to announce that we actually have enabled commercial driver license renewal also online, which previously required, it was a requirement to show up in the field office. We realized that it was a macroeconomic benefit for to make sure that our commercial drivers did what they need to do and not spend their half a day in the DMV office. Um, and uh, therefore we have made it online um, and for, I wanna say, 90, 95% of the people that are uh, commercial driver license holders are eligible for that experience. Um, in addition to that, we are also working on additional remote services for commercial drivers, like remote testing and things of that nature. And this mobile driver license is actually gonna enable some of that, given that we'll, with certainty, be able to trust you are who you are when you uh, take certain actions. Another question that came in is about how the readers actually work. Um, um, when you present a digital ID, for example, at a pharmacy to pick up medication, is there a, a tap to authenticate or uh, how does the reader actually work for the, um, uh, the relying party? Wayne, do you want to take that on and I can piggyback? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. So um, the readers, um, will work to the ISO specification 18013 part five for in-person transmission. So if you're in person somewhere and you wanna send it offline peer to peer without the internet, um, then there are two ways that are uh, pretty well implemented to engage. Um, one of them, which is what we have implemented today is to start the um, QR code scanning and that transitions to an encrypted Bluetooth connection that sends only the fields that are requested after the user consents to who's asking for the information, what are they asking for, and potentially presses OK. And um, there is also an NFC flow that is possible, and I believe that is on our roadmap as well. Um, but basically, that is also different than online readers or online verifiers that use different protocols, and that's the 18013 Part 7 protocol from ISO. But when we work on uh, W3C verifiable credentials, what we have been able to do is use the same uh, building block as the building block we use in the part seven implementation to also send the verifiable credentials and not just the ISO payloads. So we're trying to align on the same protocols as much as we can, so we can build the pipe once and a lot of things can go through it with the same privacy and security protections around it. And, and from my standpoint, I would say, you know, to to dumb it down for like con regular consumers like me who use it, it's a two-step process for anybody who's accessing. Number one step is either you tap or scan or open up a QR code and let the reader scan. And the second part is you consent for what information and the information is transmitted. For convenience stores, it's actually even simpler, uh, which is using a simpler uh, standard all you do is you open up your QR code and you share so for somebody to scan and that's it. That's the end of that particular um, uh, transaction. So very simple and very thought out uh, user experience by the standard bodies uh, and very secure as well. All right, thank you gentlemen. 
Um, Jay, I think you mentioned this, but let's just make sure you're partnering with the California Highway Patrol, uh, specifically for the California driver's license, on, on law enforcement processes such as citations, personal identification, things along those lines. Yeah, that's right. So we are actually going beyond that. So this is where, because we have our own product and we are not necessarily banking on digital giants, who we are working with, by the way, uh, as well, to release something that if people choose to use a digital wallet, uh, they can. But for specifically for DMV wallet, we are actually working on certain scenarios where this interaction of a, let's say, a roadside stop by the law enforcement and the driver, it becomes safer. Now that your credential is digital, we are contemplating remotely transmitting without the physical contact that's required for a QR code tap or even handing over the driver license and still be able to initiate that transaction and then leave the discre to the discretion of the officer if they even want to walk over or not, if there is not, it's not needed, right? Or be better prepared, right? Um, and that's something that we are contemplating as well in terms of technology advancements uh, looking at what technology is available in their vehicles, et cetera, um, and also looking at the overall ecosystem beyond CHP, right, the local police departments and sheriffs, sheriff departments as well. What exactly do they want? What exactly do they do? What kind of technology right. do they have? And so we can make this interaction much safer. That's really the agenda there. All right. And, and Ajay, I presume you're the lead test case, so you'll get pulled over for uh, speeding and be able to verify your identity this way. Uh, hopefully not, but after after 15 years, I did get a speeding ticket last uh, last month in Shasta County after uh, showing my son the, the the volcano that's been dormant. He's five and he loves volcanoes, but he also saw the experience of me getting a speeding ticket. <laughs> the funny Likewise. thing is, I, uh, I had a, a vehicle situation about three months ago, and I had a very good conversation with CHP on what is the art of the possible in such digital world of digital credentials and what's what can happen as well so we are taking yes real life hopefully not my personal experiences anymore because it's very expensive uh, for me personally but uh, you know learning from the masses working with the law enforcement officers chp is, has been very collaborative so are the local law enforcement so it's been very interesting and very meaningful conversations perfect thank you all right, we're coming close to the end, so uh, maybe one more question real quickly. Um, Long-term physical backup is, is, and this is a roadmap question, and maybe it's preliminary or premature to ask this because we're just getting started with the digital uh, driver's license. Is California looking at a uh, physical ID potentially with a chip in it or something for the future, or do you plan to go directly to mobile driver's license? Uh, do you know yet? Uh, yeah, so good question. So California is looking at various technologies uh, to make your card secure, the physical card, like digital signatures. I'll leave it at that at point in time, but it's actually a way less expensive and way better, cryptographically speaking, uh, uh, solution than, let's say, putting a chip in. Um, uh, and cheaper, by the way, very important. Um, for the... For right now, everybody should be carrying their physical card because law enforcement actually requires it. In a distant future, I'll give you an example. In EU, they have a mandate already that within the next three years, they are going to allow for a, a digital credential only use case, meaning the law enforcement officer would be required to accept a digital credential only and they cannot ask for show me your physical ID as well. Okay. So that's three years. That's very aggressive. Uh, in California, we are not there yet. We are actually in a pilot phase at the moment. We are only allowed 5% of the entire population. So get your MDL today uh, before we run out of the slots. One and a half million uh, people uh, because we have 34 million you know, total customers. So we are sitting at one, one and a half, 1 1.7 million that we can right. accept. Our hope is we'll see such a tremendous success that legislature is going to be like, yep, go for it. But not there yet. And therefore... It's a pilot and it's an optional add-on to your digital credential, which means you always have to carry your physical driver license. All right, thank you, Ajay. So as we come to the close, uh, Wayne, any final closing thoughts that you want to impart? I'm really impressed by the strategic out, uh, outlook over here in terms of from the get-go, we wanted to support, uh, Ajay wanted to support multiple credential types, not just the mobile driver's license, but vehicle registrations 
titles like disability placards, veteran status, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All these things are, you know, things that the DMV can say about people and they're empowering people, these statements to do more, right? Thinking about the use cases, the utility, and every time we're able to figure out one of those additional things, it increases what Californians can do. And that's really exciting. While having the same privacy and security safeguards, um, I think use cases that I'm especially looking forward to watching evolve is being able to create an account or log in with an MDL so that you can access services really conveniently. You might never have to remember a password again that way, right? And you can just interact with your government securely and conveniently. And I think another one that um, I think we'll, we'll start to see big demands for, I've seen multiple executive orders for figuring out solutions to the generative AI issue where we don't know what's real or not anymore. There was a video of uh, Biden saying, I don't know if that was me or generated, right? So I think that uh, basically being able to use digital identity as a base that is controlled by the user and they're allowed to basically make statements like I made that content and selectively disclose just saying that I'm a California resident and I'm not even going to say my name, but I made that content. You know, that's really powerful as we have to evolve the technology to catch up with a lot of the developments in AI. So really looking forward to supporting a bunch of these use cases and really grateful to have such a, a strong partner as the California DMV. Uh, feel free to reach out if you want to talk about any use cases. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Jay. Any real quick uh, final thoughts? Yeah, I'm excited about interagency partnerships to improve uh, the adoption of digital identity, which will improve operational uh, uh, well, add operational efficiencies and reduce costs, uh, but also public-private partnerships with, uh, you know, startups like Spruce ID here, but also with banking industry or, you know, other retail industry, et cetera, where they're looking to use these products as well. So looking forward to that roadmap and the use of this product, which I think has a lot of promise. All right. Thank you very much. Hey, I want to thank everybody that joined us for the web, uh, webinar today. We had a, a huge number of questions. We did not get to all of them. Uh, so those will be provided to the team and, and they'll be able to respond outside of the session. Thank you for submitting the questions. Some great questions in there. Uh, we could probably go for another hour uh, on this topic pretty easily. I really want to thank Ajay Gupta and Wayne Chang for joining us today. Your, your insight and your experience with this is invaluable. Um, this is going to grow uh, across the nation and, and really, as Ajay uh, mentioned, across the world. And, and you actually, I think both of you mentioned that. Um, it, it's one of those things that we can see on the roadmap for a lot of organizations. So, so very important. And it is one piece that goes into that digital wallet. There will be more. Um, there'll be other efforts that, that complement um, and, and work together with government services and private entity services. So uh, I really look forward to seeing how that goes. I want to thank Spruce ID for making the session possible today. And I also want to thank all the folks at Government Technology that came together to put this session on. And I invite all of you back to join us on a future session. Thank you very much. And I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, all. Thanks for having us.